podcast public service announcement. You're about to hear an episode in the middle of a multi-part show arc. If you haven't heard the previous episodes, we suggest you skip back to part one of this topic in the feed and listen in order. All right, Paranoid Strain Orchestra, hit it. Torturé à faire de faux aveux de convoitises homosexuelles contre nature, de corruption, de culte du diable et d'hérésie, le roi ordonna que 54 templiers soient brûlés sur le bûcher. Philippe a ordonné de monnaie trois autres d'être immolés sur un échappé d'âge sur les deux ailes. Les derniers mots de Jacques de Monet depuis son bûcher de Rouen étaient que dans un an et un jour, Philippe IV. Wonderful. Are there any positive images associated with the Templars? Well, they do play a major role in that Assassin's Creed game series we mentioned earlier. But you said they're the bad guys there, right? Kind of, but that series is all over the place. It's more like the Templars represent the forces of order, whereas the Assassins are seeking more individual freedom. There are some Templar heroes over the course of the Hillian Jillian games they've put out as well. The main reason we're mentioning it, though, is because if you've heard of the Knights Templar before this series, it's very likely that's either because you've played these games or because you've made the horrendous mistake of reading or watching The Da Vinci Code, which we will be discussing at length a little later. Suffice it to say, your time would be better spent playing the games, even the shitty ones. As we noted, this connection between the historical Ismaili assassins and the historical Knights Templar is even stronger in more modern depictions of the two groups than was the case historically. Of course, some disagree. In his book, James Wasserman asserts that the similarity of their structure as rigidly hierarchical religious orders, both devoted to armed struggle for the glory of their versions of God, made the Templars virtually a European cultural reflection of the Assassins, and that the contact between the groups is a primary cause of the Templars' adaptation of seemingly heretical practices. Going further, he sees the esoteric practices and beliefs returned to Europe by the Templars and other Crusaders as the eventual basis for the rise of hermetic and occult practices in Europe in the succeeding centuries. Is this a stretch historically? Almost certainly. But it accurately reflects the outsized roles that both groups have maintained among those who choose to follow a version of history that makes esoteric practices central. In other words, among conspiracy-friendly researchers... Leaving behind these contemporary examples of how the Templars continue to influence culture and conspiracy theorists, we come to the first flowering of a strain of thought we'll be revisiting throughout this series. The variety of conspiracy theorists for whom the Templars are merely one of the threads of a plot that stretches back to deepest antiquity and which involves essentially all of the secret societies we'll be examining in one way or another. This is the overarching world historical plot that Echo's heroes are seeking to map out in Foucault's Pendulum, and the Templars are the cornerstone. As one character posits, Suppose the Templars had a plan to conquer the world, and they knew the secret of an immense source of power, a secret whose preservation was worth the sacrifice of the whole Temple Quarter in Paris. But what could such a plan entail? Basically, everything, as Michael Hogg explains further. The blockbuster Templar plot draws loosely on history and myth. Here are some of the more crucial ingredients. James of Molay, Jacques de Molay, is a hero. Stephen Berry, in the Templar legacy, dares to suggest that the last Grand Master broke under torture, although to compensate, he says it is James of Molay's image on the Turin Shroud. But most of the time, Molay is so brave and far-sighted that it is a mystery how he failed to handle King Philip. The Templars have secret knowledge. What they know varies, but it is often suggested that in the Holy Land they became acquainted with some profound esoteric wisdom after hobnobbing with their Muslim opponents. For example, a Templar killing of an assassin envoy becomes a thread with which the most elaborate fantasies can be spun. The Templars crisscross the globe. Scotland, Paris, New York, Israel, the Languedoc, Turin, Copenhagen. No place on earth is safe, as these complex plots unravel as surrogate travelogues. A modern-day Templar geek is usually a villain, just like Sir Lee Teabing in The Da Vinci Code and the less eccentrically monikered Vance Williams in Curious the Last Templar. Popes are devious, and none more so than Leo X, 1475 to 1521, who is forever quoted as saying, It has served us well, this myth of Christ. In fact, this remark was put into the Pope's mouth by John Bale, 1495 to 1563, 
a rabidly anti-Catholic propagandist. Heresy and Satanism make good copy, especially the Templars' supposed worship of an antichrist called Baphomet. The Templars still exist, and they are behind everything. Jones also issues his own searing dismissal of this strain of thinking. Alternative histories have been concocted, suggesting an outlandish post-history. Did a small group of Templars escape persecution in France? Could they have sailed from La Rochelle with a stash of treasure? If so, did that include the Turin Shroud or the Ark of the Covenant? Did the Templars set themselves up as a secret organisation elsewhere? Are they still out there, running the world from the shadows? One needs no more than an internet connection and an imagination to find the theories that have been piled onto this platform of speculation, including the notion that the Templars were the keepers of a real-life Holy Grail, be that an actual cup or a metaphor for some ancient truth, that they had inherited their role of guardians of the truth from the Cathars, the collective name for heretics in southern France persecuted to obliteration in the early 13th century, and that this was what lay behind their downfall. But how fair would it be if we didn't offer a more credulous alternative to our hard-nosed historian's dismissal of grand conspiracy claims relating to the Templars? And conveniently, we have a subscription to Amazon Prime Video. Slogan. Our platform plays host to a shocking number of irresponsible pseudo-documentaries. Well, they really outdid themselves with a banger that we found, titled Solomon's Temple Revealed, Secrets of the Templars. Our expectations upon viewing this piece of shit were minimal, but we at least anticipated some fun visuals. Instead, this doc, which, given the low standards of Prime Video reviewers, is still only able to scrounge up one star. Anyway, it follows this guy around as he wanders around museums, showing shakily shot close-ups of various religious and ancient images, all the while narrating an indecipherable argument about how the Templars and their fall were connected to a series of state cults that worship ancient wisdom. Only the whole thing is a lot less fun than that description makes it sound. And the question has always been, why? What was it that the Templars saw in the Temple of Jerusalem that so inspired them? In the preceding years following the return of certain Templars from the Middle East, we have an upsurge in what is known today as Gothic architecture. Before this period, churches were mainly small, often wood. Suddenly, with the inspiration gathered from the Middle East, the various monastic orders, and generally led by the Templar-linked Cistercians of Europe, Europe was awash with building fever, with over 80 cathedrals being built between 1128 and 1228 in France alone. All of these buildings had or have a Gnostic and mystical influence, with hidden symbolism rife within their stonework, and giving rise to the great Freemasons. It is an accepted fact that the Templars were instigators in the rise of these Masons, and it is the Masons who hid the profound wisdom in the stones. Another amazing coincidence is that suddenly at this time in Europe sees a rise in alchemical, astronomical, medical and philosophical texts, all of this running parallel to each other. The temple then was not made for one god, but for numerous gods, and anyone who wished to worship their own god was in the right place regardless. This was a place of union, a joining of the opposite seen in the Kundalini experience, where the male and female, positive and negative, are joined to bring about true illumination. And of course, during the Crusader period, there was not one depiction of the crucifixion on any of the buildings he erected, backing up the claim that the Templars denied the crucifixion. It is thought that the Templars and the Cistercians found a wealth of ancient manuscripts containing secrets, giving them an insight into the truth behind Christianity. One thing that did emerge was the cult of the Baphomet, the Head and Sophia, the elements of serpent wisdom. If they discovered the Holy Grail, as many have said, then the secrets of the Grail were what they truly discovered. So far, we have seen that the true temple must not be touched by hand, that Moses was an emergent serpent from Egypt, and that Hiram, the exalted head or snake, was the master of balance.
I think I got a perfect soundtrack idea for this guy. Dana, you're better than that. I'm not, but you are. Okay, we're about ready to move on from the Templars, but in doing so, we need to come back to two elements of the Templar story. The first is, as we previously mentioned, legend and literature have linked the Templars to the Holy Grail. The other is, the Templars are also connected to the Shroud of Turin, a piece of cloth believed by some to be the burial shroud of Christ, but believed by those who understand carbon dating to be a medieval forgery. This sounds like the kind of thing that would have been totally ginned up by the conspiracists to keep things interesting. Legendary knights put in charge of a priceless relic, etc. Which makes it all the more fascinating when Mr. Hogg points out, per documents provided by the Vatican itself, the Templars were indeed in charge of protecting the Shroud. The Turin Shroud is claimed to be the linen cloth that covered the body of Jesus after the crucifixion. A relic answering to its description was among the treasures that were taken from Constantinople when the city was sacked by the Fourth Crusade in 1204. But the certain provenance of the Shroud can only be traced back to 1357, when it was displayed in the church at Lire, in the Diocese of Troyes, by the widow of a French knight called Geoffrey of Charnay, who, it is said, was the nephew of that same Geoffrey of Charnay, burnt at the stake with James of Molay. This has led some historians to believe that after the sack of Constantinople, the linen relic passed into the hands of the Templars, who took it to France, where it formed part of their famous treasure. But is this true? Remarkably, in April 2009, support came from the Vatican itself, where Barbara Frale, the scholar who discovered the Chinon parchment, found a further document. This one, the testimony of Arno Sabatier, a young Frenchman who entered the order in 1287. As part of his initiation, he said, he was taken to, quote, a secret place to which only the brothers of the temple had access, where he was shown a long linen cloth on which was impressed the figure of a man, and was told to venerate the image by kissing its feet three times. The Templars had rescued the shroud to ensure that it did not fall into the hands of heretics, but it does suggest that the cross today known as the Turin Shroud, fake or not, was in the possession of the Templars, that they believed it to be real, and that for a century it played a central part in their initiation ceremonies. But protecting it from whom? Well, it turns out the Templars intersect with both the Grail legend and the Shroud of Turin in relation to a sect of legendary heretics who have their own vital place in the history of secret society conspiracies. The French religious group who called themselves the Good Men, but whom everyone else knows as... We So, first things first, who the hell were these Cathars? How did they constitute a secret society? What happened to them? And how do they connect to the Knights Templar? Now hold your horses there, Dana. You're getting ahead of yourself. You wrote that line and had me read it. It's okay. I don't blame you for being excited. You are impossible. Wow. Dana's really eager to start talking about how the Cathars fit into the overarching Templar conspiracy. But first we need to know why these good men, or good Christians, were considered a major heretical threat to the Orthodox Christianity of the period. When he says Orthodox in this section, he's using the one with a little o, indicating the mainstream European Christian church of the time, the one that we now call the Roman Catholic Church. He's not saying the big O Greek Orthodox Church. Capitalization turns out to be a bit to explain via audio, but if we don't use the term orthodox, then we have to keep saying mainstream church throughout the section as a contrast to the heretical Cathar movement, and that can start to feel repetitive. That may be our most Baroque over-explanation to date, but it's true. In the 12th through 14th centuries, there was only one Christian church whose theology ruled the day in Europe. It's completely different these days. Most European countries are home to a huge variety of Christian churches, which are nearly empty because everyone's an atheist. 
Of course, we're focused on a period when the church was as close to all-powerful as any institution in history. In fact, for the preceding several centuries, the Christian church was remarkably, theologically, docile. Everybody took their spiritual cues from the Holy See in Rome. This period is also known as the Dark Ages. That's true, but modern scholars think that terminology is basically a slur on the era. It's fair to say that there was much more moving and shaking in, for example, the Middle East and China during the period. But even so, it's weird to call several hundred years dark just because white historians over-rotate on whatever Europe was doing in a given time frame, which during this era was not much in terms of scientific, economic, or cultural advancement. But it would be like saying the NBA was terrible over the past 40 years because the Knicks can't get it together. How confident do you feel about that sports analogy? Confidence level? Zero. But suck it, Knicks fans! Uh, the breaking news from here is that no matter what the Knicks do, they will suck for my entire life. <laughs> now that we understand the grip the church had over medieval Europe, we then have to ask, what was the Cathar heresy and why was it a big deal? As Straniacs, you know what's coming. Before we get to the actual history, we first have to deal with the most basic questions that underpin this situation. In this case, that's the philosophical and theological conundrum known as the problem of evil. Here we'll let the video on this subject from Crash Course Philosophy's YouTube channel set the table for why this is such a big issue for all of your major monotheisms. Many theists believe in an omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent God. But atheists argue that this creates a contradiction, a set of beliefs that can't all be true at the same time. Because evil is bad, right? Whether it's stubbed toes or genocide or paper cuts or epidemics. So if there's really an all-knowing God out there, he knows about all the evil. He might even know about it before it happens. And if he's all-powerful, he could stop it. And if he's all-good, then he would want to stop it. And yet he doesn't. The evil continues. Philosophically rational people shouldn't hold inconsistent beliefs, so Atheists argue that you're going to have to give something up, and the thing to give up is God. Some theists, however, take a different route. They choose to give up one or more divine attributes. They argue that maybe God isn't powerful enough to stop evil, or maybe he's not knowledgeable enough to know about it, or maybe he's not even good enough to care about stopping it. Still, despite this scriptural evidence, many theists are committed to God's omni-attributes and are thus stuck with a problem. They have to resolve the logical problem of evil and find some way to explain why God would allow evil into the world. As you might expect, this scenario has, in turn, led to all kinds of efforts on the part of believers to provide sensible responses. In fact, there has been so much brain power devoted to arguing about this topic over the centuries that there's a special name for these apologetic arguments, theodicy. So you can bet that we've heard some pretty well thought out explanations for why an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent God might have created a world in which incredible evil could still be perpetrated. Most of these arguments revolve around free will. That is, it's more important to God that humans have total freedom to act as they choose because only freely chosen good deeds can possibly be truly good. And that makes sense as far as it goes until you consider that means that it's so important that humans are able to execute their free wills that it's worth the brutal torture murder of countless human beings, including children, over the past several hundred thousand years of human existence and evolution. Jesus, Jesser, that's fucking dark. Hey, it's not my idea. Take it up with the apologists. So these sorts of arguments have been refined over the centuries, but they were already being used in similar form to explain the existence of evil in the world back in the 12th and 13th centuries. And as you might assume, even then, plenty of other thinkers brought up issues with these purported solutions. For example, one, the free will argument fails to address the issue of natural evils. That is, all of the many non-human sources of seemingly endless suffering in the world. Earthquakes, raging wildfires, mudslides. <coughs> And that's just in California. Is this thing on? Thank you. You're a great audience. Try the veal. Tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, poisonous snake bites, etc. These aren't caused by humans and therefore don't implicate free will. Two. Most people, religious apologists included, prefer to be on the side of an argument that isn't justifying the existence of child murder. We'll save further developments on this topic and how neuroscience is messing with the traditional parameters of the free will debate for some other show down the line. What we want to focus on here is the fact that, in the case of Christianity, addressing the problem of evil and what it means for our conceptions of God has been an issue from the very beginning. And different answers to that question have led to important doctrinal arguments that, in the worst instances, have eventually resulted in bloodshed. I don't like how this is sounding for the Cathars, whom I believe you already mentioned aren't really around much anymore. Again, Dana, jumping the gun. 
and don't go blaming the script for your being a walking spoiler alert. But, but... Noting that it's difficult for anyone who believes in an omnipotent, all-knowing, all-good God to explain the existence of evil, Jonathan Sumption, in his excellent book, The Albigensian Crusade... Wait, I thought these were the Cathars. Why is the war against them called the Albigensian Crusade? Because the heresy was particularly popular in the city of Albi, and that led to some using the name of that city for the whole movement. Anyway, Sumption notes that this issue in particular makes those who professed a dualist philosophy... That is, a view that sees there as being two all-powerful entities. The good one who created the spiritual realm, and the evil one who created the material world that we all experience. Yeah, folks who believe that were uniquely threatening to the then unquestioned and presumably unquestionable Catholic Church, because the dualists had a very simple theological solution to the problem of evil. God was not the creator of the world. All matter was the creation of the demiurge, a spirit of evil, autonomous, self-creating, who made man in his own likeness. God had implanted in man the consciousness of good, thus enabling him to save himself. But he could not control the material world, and to that extent, God was not omnipotent. Clearly, for the dualist, if man was to return to his true father in the real heaven, then he would stay as far from the material world as possible, making himself ever more spirit and ever less a physically instantiated being. So, people decided on this dualist philosophy around the 12th century, when the church started gearing up for their anti-heretic crusade? Oh, shit, no. The beginning of this belief, which, again, we have to emphasize is only considered a heresy because most Christian believers of the time ended up aligned against it. Anyway, the most important promoter of this dualist philosophy in early Christianity, Marcion, was a rich shipowner in Asia Minor, that is, modern-day Turkey, who organized an early Gnostic church around his teachings by the year 144. As is typical of dualists throughout Christian history, Marcion's followers rejected the Old Testament as the scripture of the followers of the evil god of this world. But more importantly, and again in keeping with future dualists like the Cathars, they wanted as little to do with the gross material of this world as possible, meaning they rejected both marriage and sexual intercourse as sinful because they tied believers to their filthy material bodies and eventually led to the creation of new baby bodies. Now, if you're trying to create a successful Christian group, there's a lot to be said for the seriousness and asceticism of Marcion's approach. But that last bit we mentioned contains the philosophy's Achilles heel, to wit. If you're in the middle of a theological conflict, and the other side encourages making babies, and your side discourages it, you're going to end up with a lot fewer followers as the decades pass. Marcion and the other Gnostics, whose full theology of dualism and rad names for spiritual beings, like Yalda Baoth, we covered in the Reality Part 2 Philip K. Dick episode eventually lost the theological struggle on both the disputative and procreative sides, as far as we know, without any internecine violence, probably because they only duked this out in opposing religious tracts. At the time, no sect of Christianity could trot out an army to bolster its arguments and smite the unbelievers. The same was not true for the Manichaeans, the next major dualist heresy, which was extant in the early 5th century CE, and which famously was the first theology embraced by Augustine of Hippo, before his conversion to mainstream Christianity and his subsequent posthumous elevation to St. Augustine. Once he switched sides, Augustine became one of the greatest theological scourges of his initial faith, which was based on the teachings of a Persian named Mani. Mani taught that the world was, in the dualist tradition, ruled by a non-omnipotent but good god and an evil devil who created and ruled the material world. Mani differed from Marcion and other Christian Gnostics by incorporating Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and other beliefs into his worldview. He also suggested that each of these faiths, as well as Christianity, was incomplete. Let me guess whose ideas would bring these other faiths to completion. Exactly. Mani was a final revelation prophet, much like Muhammad and Joseph Smith after him. But importantly, he also didn't completely disdain the physical world the way the Marcionists and other Gnostics did. Rather, he focused on the struggle between light and dark within each human body and soul, as well as within the material that made up the external world. But the Manichaeans got wiped out too? Oh, fuck yeah. From their inception in the 3rd century, they were persecuted first by the Persians, then by the pagan Roman Empire, then by the Christian Church via the authority of the Christianized Roman Empire, and by the 6th century, they were no longer a going concern. From then until the 11th century, the Christian world was fairly united theologically, though of course there were small pockets of dualism and other heresies popping up here and there. By the time that these groups began to take hold in Christian Europe and came to the attention of the authorities in the mid-12th century, as Malcolm Lambert notes in his book The Cathars, 
leading churchmen in Western Europe had no living experience of heresy. The only heresies to be found were either the work of individual theologians or the casual idiosyncrasies of rustic preachers with no theological training. Jonathan Sumption, in his Albigensian Crusade, piles on. There was no clearly defined crime of heresy, no judicial principles from which to seek guidance, no procedures, and no prescribed penalties. And so the local clergy, confronted with theological opposition to the faith, turned to the consolation that pedantic members of the ruling ideology have taken refuge in since time immemorial. That is, the belief that the most obdurate heretic would ultimately yield to recent argument. But here's where the theological rubber hits the materialist road. Most of the clergy who were in a position to argue against the dualist heresy that was infiltrating Europe, and particularly southern France, weren't prepared to counter the learned and erudite arguments of the Cathar perfects because it had been centuries since training to debate and defeat heretics had been an important part of priestly education. It's like how the defense against the dark arts curriculum at Hogwarts really hit the skids after Tom Riddle got blowed up by the mom-loved lightning bolt on Harry's forehead. As the threat fades, training fades with it. Indeed. As Sumption notes, the rare instances of dualism over several centuries before the rise of Cathars weren't even catalogued or categorized by religious authorities. Heresy as a whole was so rare that heretics who had never even heard of Manny and probably weren't dualists to start with were labeled Manichaeans because nobody knew any other word that meant what we think of as heretic. As Sumption outlines, the heresy quietly infiltrated Europe as dualist Armenian colonists were moved into the Balkans by the Byzantine Empire in the 8th century so that by the 9th century, heretical missionaries had taken root in Bulgaria, a region that at that point had only recently been converted to Christianity of the Eastern variety. The leader of this movement was a priest named Bogomil, who came to embrace a dualist philosophy that traced its theology back to the Apostle Paul, rejecting the Old Testament and ascribing the material world to the creation of Satan. Moreover, his followers wouldn't eat meat or milk, considered the cross a symbol of mistaken focus on Christ's death instead of his ministry as the center of Christian belief, and refused all Christian sacraments, including the Eucharist. Professor Spence takes it from here. But further east, in Bulgaria, Serbia, in the, the Byzantine territories, then you have the emergence of the Bogomils. And the Bogomils are just the Cathars under a different name. And they are connected with each other. Sometime in the 11th century, there is someone who is a kind of a grand poobah, and no one knows exactly what he was, his father Nicetus, who comes from Constantinople, where he is the head of this Bogomil church. And he comes to Italy, and he holds an entire sort of synod with other Cathar bishops, and they take instructions from him. The Cathars in France and Italy were only part of what was a conscious counter-church that stretched all the way from Constantinople to southern France. And one of the things that Nicetus did is that he consecrated and re-consecrated Cathar bishops, basically by telling some of them that your consecration was wrong, so I'm going to tell you how to do it right. The Cathars, the Bogomils, what this group was, it was a kind of invisible counter-church with its own bishops, its own hierarchy, its own holy books, its own theology. And remember, what its theology said was that the Roman Catholic Church was the synagogue of Satan, that it was a false church that was devoted to the evil God, that its wealth showed that it was a manifestation of the corrupt material world, and therefore everything it stood for was evil. It's not like they're going to have a dialogue. It wasn't as if you were going to have Cathar bishops and Catholic bishops sit down, and we will all have a conclave, and we'll talk out our differences and come up with... No, it was, there was an opposite end of things. From the Catholic perspective, the Catholic Church was simply an evil, misbegotten institution, the creation of an evil God in an evil world. And to the Roman Catholic Church, the Cathars were a dangerous, deconstructing heresy that threatened everything the Church stood for, its very existence in every sense. And it was popular. That's the other thing. It was drawing people in. Conveniently for the heretics, the portion of modern-day France they settled into was particularly blasé about heretical ideas. While these days the Toulouse region is integrated into the mainstream of French society, at the time it was considered a unique locale with its own language, customs, and a distinct way of life. Languedoc was more rural, Mediterranean, and less regimented or bureaucratic than the lands ruled by the French king. By the mid-12th century, it was clear that some dangerous teaching was circulating in this area. In 1145, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, 
That's the dude whom the closest listeners among you will recall was the church patron who won for the Templars not only the support of the papacy, but also the group's total independence from all authority, save their own grandmaster and the Pope himself. Yes, that very same Templar benefactor and leader of the Orthodox Cistercian Order of Monks was so concerned about the spread of Catharism in this region that he determined to visit in the summer of 1145 in spite of poor health. The source in this case of the unorthodox and disturbing teaching seems to have been a heretical preacher named Henri, who had wandered through the afflicted areas since 1116 when he showed up as a penniless, barefoot proselytizer. He had a real knack for bringing folks to his theological side through humor and scripture, relates Peg, and asked the sort of impertinent questions that eventually led the good citizens of Athens to insist our buddy Socrates suck down a hemlock milkshake. St. Bernard saw this Henri guy as afflicted with and... Please believe we're quoting directly to give you a flavor of the banal anti-Semitism of the time. Amazing and truly Jewish blindness. Yeesh. Yeah, but remember, life for most Jews during this era was a struggle to build up enough resources that whenever the local ruler decided to blame you for a bad weather cycle or some mysterious disease or an earthquake or his own corruption or whatever, and the local peasantry drove you out of the region, you would be able to rebuild your life in some marginally less murderous locality. And the authorities treated Jewish people this way because they blamed Jews for deicide. God sent his son, Jesus, to be born a Jew and die for your sins, and you guys helped the Romans kill God and never accepted him even afterward. And therefore, anything we do to you is totally kosher. Awkward phrasing. Perhaps, but the point is Bernard, a mainstream and therefore Jew-blaming religious figure of his era, is moved to stamp out the heresy Henri is promoting because he sees Henri's ideas as being as dangerous as those of the Christ-murdering Jews. In other words, to Bernard, this heresy was the biggest sort of theological threat to the all-caps TRUTH, as revealed by the Church. 